What's up, y'all? Welcome back to Purple Bear Biology. This is Professor Hurley here, and we're going to talk about the evolution of a genome in this episode. So we're going to focus in on these three main questions. What a genome is, why in the world we do something called genome sequencing, and how do genomes change over time? The overall goal here is to understand where diversity comes from. We look around our world and we see numerous features that are unique to every individual organism. Even organisms in the same species or group of reproducing organisms are capable of having varying characteristics. Where do these characteristics come from? They come from the genome. So let's talk about how the genome results in changes that we see all around us. First though, let's make sure we understand what a genome is. You probably remember from some biology course that a genome is all of the genetic material that we can find inside of an organism. This genome for us is in the form of DNA, deoxyribose nucleic acid, which is just another way of saying that we have a specific set of instructions inside of every one of our cells that tells our cells how to build proteins and give us the features that we see in our everyday life. You may recall that building proteins is a two-step process. Starting from transcription, taking our DNA, converting it into a usable message that can be taken out of the nucleus, and then that message is used to create an, an amino acid sequence that builds in proteins. While all of that can sound pretty complicated, the amazing thing about DNA is that it's complicated but also simplistic at the same time. Don't forget that DNA is basically four nucleotides bound together. Adenines that bind with thymines, cytosines that bind with guanines. In all of these cases, it's these four chemical structures that code for all of the characteristics that we see around us. If we take into account all of the genetic material that we have inside of our cells, we can find a printout of our different chromosomes, which is just consolidated down DNA in what is called a karyotype. We as humans have 46 chromosomes total, 23 pairs. Each of these chromosomes represents a segment of our genomic information that has genes on it. Genes are coded sections of our DNA that are associated with different characteristics. Now, not all of our genome actually codes for things. Sometimes we have information that is left over from our previous ancestors, called pseudogenes, or we can have sections that may have originally coded for something but are no longer functional. The last type of thing that we could have that is not actually coding genes would be segments of DNA that are associated with gene regulation. So all of our genes don't need to be expressed all at the same time. Instead, we wanna have the ability to turn some genes off and some genes on. So we use non-coding sections, sections that do not directly code for traits, to regulate gene expression. One of the most remarkable things I ever discovered in biology was the incredible similarity between organisms on this planet. We all use the same four nucleotides inside of our genetic information. Some of us use DNA, some of us use RNA, and a lot of times the bases are different depending on how distinctly different we are from the organisms, but the similarities are striking. Everything is basically built from the same genetic code. Cool fact alert! Did you know that you can actually get your pet's genome sequenced? Why in the world do you think you would want to do that? Well, that question kind of leads us to why in the world would we sequence a genome in the first place? You may realize that sequencing genomes can be incredibly beneficial, especially when we want to learn which genes cause particular traits. But not only that, we can sequence genomes to look in areas for changes to better understand why one organism differs from another. This also allows us to understand how genes get expressed over time. Speaking of gene expression, let's talk a little bit about that. Gene expression is essentially what happens when a gene is transcribed and translated over into functional proteins. We can find gene expression all around us, including things like our eye color, our hair color, how tall you get. Even behavioral preferences and genetic disorders are correlated to gene expression. Check this out. I bet you didn't know this. Calico cats occur in females only. Why? Well, because females actually have 
two working copies of the X chromosome. So coloration can occur in one variety on one of those copies of the chromosome, and the coloration can be in a different gene variety in the other chromosome. So both of them can be expressed simultaneously, giving us a mixture of colors rather than one solid color. Okay, so all of that's pretty neat, but none of it really explains how in the world this changes over time. So the first thing that should pop into your mind when you think of genes changing is mutation. So essentially, mutation is where damage occurs to the DNA. There's lots of different types of damage that can occur, and most of the time these mutations are neutral, meaning they have no effect, or are incredibly detrimental, meaning that they could influence the survivability of the organism. On very rare occasions, though, the mutation is beneficial. I like to think about this like superheroes. Superheroes often can have rare mutations that give them superpowers. This enables them to perform better than they did before. Where do these mutations come from, you ask? Well, the environment. Mutations can occur just by random chance whenever we're transcribing and translating information over. For example, your genome has about 3 billion nucleotides, 3 billions of those A's, T's, G's, and C's all matched up together. And every time a cell divides, it has to copy each one of those. Think about it. If you had to copy 3 billion letters, A's, G's, T's, and C's down in a relatively short period of time, do you think you'd make any errors copying it from one page to another? Sure, we all would, and your cells are no different as well. So your cells make about one error every billion bases. So every time a cell divides, it makes approximately three errors in the genome. Now most of those are neutral mutations, or they're detrimental and the cell dies. There are other sources outside of just copying in our environment. For example, ultraviolet light from the sun damages DNA inside of our skin. If you take carcinogens, chemicals that can create mutations inside of our genome from things like cigarettes or barbecue or even some of the chemicals that we can find in our everyday life like shampoos and facial masks and makeups, there are even some crazy cool pathogens that can influence our genome especially in viruses that can insert their genetic information into our own genome, causing disruptions and changing how things get translated. Okay, so let's take a look at how this works. You start off with DNA and it gets translated and transcribed into protein. If everything goes correct, there are no mutations that take place inside of there, and we end with a functional protein at the end. However, if we get a point mutation, let's say the genome changes. This individual nucleotide change can result in a change in the amino acid that gets put inside of the protein, leading to a mutated protein that does not form its function properly. These mutations can occur in all sorts of really cool ways. For example, you can have a nucleotide inserted Adding an additional nucleotide to it changes the entire reading sequence of DNA. Don't forget, DNA is actually read in sets of three. So if I add an additional nucleotide in there, it shifts the entire reading frame. In addition to inserting new nucleotides, entire nucleotides can be left out during the transcription and translation process or during the DNA duplication process. One other common type of error is a substitution where one nucleotide actually gets substituted for another nucleotide. This can result in an amino acid change that then changes the entire structure of the protein. Now, all of those are where the nucleotides get changed, but if we back out to the chromosome level, remember that chromosomes are a whole bunch of genes and non-coding regions that are basically billions of nucleotides long. If we change entire sections of a chromosome, we can get dynamic effects. There are lots of different types of chromosome mutations. For example, we can have deletions that delete entire portions of the chromosome or duplications that add an additional section where we duplicate one part of the chromosome and add it in. Or we can take sections of the chromosome and invert them so that one gene now comes before the other. This would change the order of the amino acids that took place. There are even really crazy chromosome mutations where we can take one portion of a chromosome and move it on to another chromosome. This is one way that the number of chromosomes a particular species has can change from species to species. Let's take a look. Remember that our cells can undergo two primary cellular processes, mitosis and meiosis. 
mitosis creates a duplicate copy of the cells, whereas meiosis reduces the overall chromosome number down by half so that we get gametes for reproduction. These processes do not always take place correctly. Sometimes errors can occur, and that's what we're seeing here. So all of these chromosomes matched up for separation into two separate cells. But an error occurs, and one of the chromosome pairings gets separated to the opposite side of the cell. This ends up with too many chromosomes in this individual cell, and then when they separate out, we get gametes that have one extra chromosome compared to what they're supposed to have. If these gametes then went on to get fertilized, we could end up with differential chromosome numbers from our original parents. If these became reproductively isolated, we would develop new species. Additional chromosomes in this manner can create novel characteristics and incredibly detrimental diseases. This is one of the ways that we get the genetic disorder, Down syndrome. So let's take a closer look at how this works. So chromosomes can undergo something called fusion events, where one chromosome can be created from two chromosomes. This is what is thought to have happened with chimpanzees and humans. So chimpanzees have chromosome 12 and 13, but if we were to take 12 and 13 and compare them to our human chromosome 2, we find that it's incredibly similar sections of genomic information, as if these two were spliced together in a fusion event. This would lead to a reduction in overall chromosome number. So while chimpanzees have additional chromosomes, we have the same genetic information, it's just we have fewer chromosomes due to a fusion event. Now in addition to fusion events, you need to think of our chromosomes as kind of like Legos. Imagine you take a long string of Legos and they're stacked together. You could take one of the Legos out of the middle and move it to the end. Or if you had two strands of Legos, you could take one of the Legos out of those strands and move it over to another strand. This is called transposition. Transposable regions are one of the primary ways that we can get diversity inside of our chromosomes. This happens primarily inside of meiosis when our chromosome pairs match up we can get this crossing over event that takes place where genetic information gets switched from one chromosome to the other. The last type of scenario that I want to talk about is exon shuffling. So remember that in eukaryotic cells we have introns and exons. And the introns get spliced out and the exons get spliced together. Because this takes place, you can think of this a lot like shuffling a deck of cards. So just like shuffling a deck of cards, you can pull cards from anywhere in the deck and create a hand from it. The same scenario can take place with our chromosomes. We can shuffle exons together to create new novel arrangements of specific gene sets. This creates new expression of genes and amino acids and gives us new novel traits inside of organisms. The really cool thing about this is as this takes place over time, we can actually track gene evolution. For example, your red blood cells use a protein called a heme group in order to facilitate oxygen transport. However, your hemoglobin proteins are thought to have been from a branching family of proteins that developed over time, where there was originally one gene for some type of globulin protein. This gene then becomes duplicated and differs. Whenever we duplicate genes, and they're no longer attached to one another, they can encounter mutations separately. And then the same thing can occur as additional changes take place. It's kind of cool, right? Okay, guys. So, okay, guys. So, in this video, what we talked about was what a genome is and how that genome can change over time due to point mutations inside of nucleotides and chromosomal mutations where entire segments of a chromosome can be modified. Hopefully, you found all that helpful and cool. If you liked the video, be sure to click the like button and don't forget to hit the subscribe button as well. That way, you can continue to follow along with additional videos as I release them. All right, guys, that's it for this episode of Purple Bear Biology. As always, thank you all so much for watching, and see you all next time.